welcome on a Thursday morning, almost 9 a.m. sharp. Uh, so we're going to start the session. And first speaker is Carl Friedrich Israel of Leipzig University. And he's going to be talking about the fiat money illusion on the cost efficiency of modern central banking. So, so welcome, Carl, with applause. OK, um, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to see you all. I'm happy that you made it at this early hour. Um, after such a packed first day of the conference. Um, I think my topic is very good for the start because the idea of the paper is very simple. It's in, in essence, it's just an accounting exercise. Okay? We will look at the uh, cost efficiency of uh, modern central banks. Um, this paper is an extension of an earlier publication of mine in the Economics Bulletin where I specifically look at the Euro system and its cost structure. And here in, in the paper that I present today, um, I also look at the Federal Reserve um, System, the Bank of Japan, and the Bank of England. So we have the four um, biggest um, central banks or central bank systems in the world. Um, what's the motivation for uh, this paper or this research uh, in general? Um, it's the classical cost-saving argument uh, for the classical economists have um, argued for uh, fiduciary elements in the money supply, not so much because it would make um, monetary policy more flexible, <clears throat> but because um, it would be less costly to produce. Right? Fiduciary media are less costly to, uh, to produce than genuine metallic money, gold or silver. And um, the classical economists, of course, were well aware of the dangers of, of such a flexible money, uh, money supply, um, especially when it is controlled by governments. And so their argument for uh, fiduciary media or uh, fiat money was essentially based on it would be cheaper to produce, and that could be an advantage for the economy overall. Um, and we really find this argument, or the roots of this argument, uh, already in Adam Smith's uh, Wealth of Nations. Uh, in, in 1776, uh, he has pointed out um, that, yeah, it could be beneficial for an, for an economy, for a society, to replace cheap paper um, or to, to have cheap paper instead of metallic money. Um, you could use the metallic money that you uh, would, would not use in circulation and sell it to other countries that would give you a one-shot advantage when you could uh, buy goods and services from other countries and you could invest them and thus have, uh, have an advantage of it. And then the argument is more uh, explicit even in David Ricardo's principles um, where he says that uh, a currency is in its most um, perfect state when it, it consists entirely of paper. But, and this is a, an important addition, paper that uh, is of equal value as the gold or, uh, or you know, the genuine money that it uh, purports to uh, replace. So the idea was that you have paper instead of gold or silver, but uh, it would um, be managed uh, ideally in such a way as the gold standard would work. So the argument is really not about monetary policy and, and monetary expansion specifically, but purely about the costs. And what is interesting about the argument is that it has also permeated into some of the writings of the Austrian school. Um, so here I've selected uh, three important um, uh, members of the Austrian school. Of course, Karl Menger as the founder, then uh, Friedrich von Wieser, and then Ludwig uh, von Mises, um, who have all uh, at least partly uh, or partially acknowledged um, the potential advantages of fiduciary media, not of outright fiat money, but of fiduciary media in the money supply. So you have uh, Karl Menger's uh, encyclopedia entry in the Handwerterbuch der Staatswissenschaften uh, on, on money. Uh, Geld is, uh, is the original German title. There is a translation of this uh, encyclopedia entry by Leland Jäger, which is, which is pretty good. So if you're interested and don't read German, you can read it. And Karl Menger says, yes, uh, it, it can be advantages uh, for, for an economy, for a society to have fiduciary media and sell off 
and some of the gold that would otherwise be used in circulation. Uh, Friedrich Wieser wrote the, uh, the, um, in the next edition of the, the uh, Handwerter Buch, wrote uh, after the death of Menger, wrote the article on money and repeated the argument. Um, and then, of course, Ludwig von Mises uh, also pointed out some potential advantages uh, of fiduciary media in, uh, in his habilitation the uh, thesis, The Theory of Money and Credit. Later on in human action, he denied uh, uh, all the uh, all potential benefits of fiduciary media. And this has, of course, sparked a, a huge debate among Austrian economists. But um, really, the important point uh, here is just, even among Austrian economists, the argument exists and has been taken up. And Austrian economists, more than uh, any other economists, are known for their uh, uncompromising stance on money. Um, and um, given that even Austrians have taken up the argument, the cost-saving argument, um, it is also no surprise that, of course, we find it today in modern textbooks. And I have two examples here. I have the uh, very famous textbook uh, by Samuels and Nordhaus, um, where they say, yeah, the disadvantage of metallic money is precisely that you need uh, real resources to dig it out of the ground. And then, more specifically, Again, in Krugman and Wells, um, that's the, their textbook on international trade, they refer to Smith's uh, famous uh, metaphor for paper money as being a wagon way through the air. And then uh, they ask rhetorically, uh, why make any use at all of gold and silver? And of course, the answer is, well, <laughs> Don't worry, we don't use it anymore because have, having a pure fiat money is even more of a wagon way through the air uh, and it doesn't need any real resources except the paper uh, on that, you print, uh, that you print the uh, banknotes with. Okay, so that's the cost-saving argument um, uh, for fiat money. Um, of course, now we could uh, directly uh, look at central banks and, and what they actually cost in terms of their operating expenses. But uh, first of all, we need the benchmark, right? Uh, the argument implicitly here is that, well, if we have a fiat money, we, we save all the resources we would otherwise use in order to uh, produce gold money. That's the historical um, alternative. Um, the question is, how much would it cost to have a gold standard? And luckily, we have uh, uh, some estimates. The f one of the first uh, estimates was uh, given by Milton Friedman in the late 1950s and early 60s. <clears throat> and uh, Friedman tried to estimate um, the annual resource costs of a gold standard relative to GDP. So we have um, delta G, um, which is the nominal value of the change in the gold stock. Uh, and Y is uh, nominal income, or uh, GDP. And he decomposed this fraction that he wanted to estimate into three um, uh, parts. Um, so we have, uh, first of all, um, delta G divided by delta M. So that's the nominal value of the change in the money stock divided by the change in the, in, uh, uh, the nominal value of the gold stock divided by the uh, change in the money stock times uh, the change in the money stock divided by the money stock, so that's the percentage change of the money stock, uh, times um, the money stock divided by nominal income. And the money stock here, and that's important in Friedman's estimate, is M2. Okay, so it's not the base money supply, it's, uh, it's not M1, it's M2. It's very important. Um, I will explain that a little later. Now, Friedman said, okay, we have these two uh, factors and we can find empirical um, estimates of those. Okay, um, first of all, uh, Friedman said, okay, we want to have a 100% uh, gold uh, standard, 100%. We want to estimate the cost of, of such a gold standard. And again, he said 100% on M2, which is, um, of course, uh, somewhat um, um, tricky because even the most um, outspoken advocates of the gold standard say we would want to have 100% on M1. But okay, so this means that the fraction delta G divided by delta M is one, okay? Every increase in the money stock, delta M, is completely, um, uh, there is an uh, according um, 
increase in the gold stock. So this fraction is one. Furthermore, Friedman said, well, if we want to have price stability, then um, the, the fraction delta m divided by m must be 4%, because um, considering real economic growth, having a, an expansion of the money stock by uh, 4% would roughly uh, ensure price stability. And then um, he empirically estimated um, uh, the fraction m divided by by Y and said this is about 62.5%. Um, okay, so the money stock M2 divided by normal income is about 62.5%. And we put this all together and we find, okay, the annual costs of the gold standard, of a 100% gold standard, 100% on M2, would be 2.5% of GDP every year. Okay? That's um, somewhat of an exaggeration, and, and Lawrence White has pointed this out. His argument, um, however, is that, well, if we want to have a gold standard, we would, of course, not have a 100% gold standard, but we um, are content with having 2% reserves. 2% um, historically have existed, for example, in the free banking um, period in Scotland that Larry White has and George Selgin, of course, have studied. And if you make this change, if you change um, the, um, the, the reserve ratio from 100% to 2%, your estimate goes down to 0.05% of GDP every year. So this looks um, much better already. Um, <clears throat> however, um, Lawrence White suggested another adjustment because when he presented his estimate that was in the 1990s, um, some decades later, he said that the velocity of money had increased so that a 2% um, money growth rate uh, would, uh, would be sufficient to have price stability. So he reduced um, the 4% of the money growth rate down to 2% and the cost go even uh, further down. Okay, so this estimate is done 2% um, gold standard, fractional reserve gold standard would cost every year about 0.025% of GDP. Okay, um, you can ask, <clears throat> can we uh, lower this uh, cost even further? And um, yeah, there are at least two, two arguments why, um, why the cost could be even lower. Lawrence White himself pointed out that, well, if we have a gold standard, we could still uh, replace uh, genuine uh, uh, gold coins by, by token coins that would uh, reduce the cost further. Um, but more importantly, I think, is an argument that uh, Roger Garrison presented, and he said if we really had a free banking system, of course um, we wouldn't have uh, uh, an expansion of the money stock in such a way that there would be price stability, so that the overall price level wouldn't change at all. Um, because the uh, supply, uh, the price elasticity of supply uh, of gold is not perfect. Okay, when you have um, real economic growth, this, was, with, this would translate partly into a reduction of prices. So you would have price inflation to some extent in such a, a monetary environment. And so, if you accept uh, this and say, okay. Um, we would uh, have price deflation. The money stock would actually expand uh, s uh, slower than, say, 2% that, um, that, that, <coughs> that Lawrence White uh, suggested. Then the costs, of course, uh, go down even further. Um, and um, Yeah, um, but again, you could also argue, argue in, the, in the opposite direction and say, well, 2% reserves is um, excessively low and is not really representative of a, of a genuine gold standard. So what happens if you increase um, the reserve ratio? And what you can do here is, of course, well, let's take... Um, Let's take the uh, Rothbard's uh, suggestion of 100% reserves on M1. If you do this, um, then the cost would roughly be, taking the other numbers that uh, Lawrence White uses, would be about 0.1875% uh, uh, of GDP. 
Okay, then you can argue in, in other directions, can say, well, the velocity has changed, real economic growth has changed. Um, so we round this number up and say, okay, we have an upper, uh, upper bound benchmark of 0.2% of GDP every year for a 100% gold standard um, on M1. And this gives us a range of estimated values. Okay, we have a very optimistic lower bound, 0.0. 0.5% and 0.2% of GDP. Those, those are the costs that we want to save with a fiat money uh, system. Um, and now let's look at the expenses of um, a modern fiat money systems. And here we have the costs of uh, the, uh, of the uh, euro system. Um, unfortunately, the euro system doesn't publish a consolidated um, annual report. So I looked at the annual reports of every national central bank. Uh, in the upper left panel, you have the smaller founding members. In the upper right panel, you have the, the bigger founding members and also Greece, which is somewhat of an exceptional case. In my earlier publication, I discussed Greece a little uh, in more detail. And uh, down there, you have the uh, joining members over time. And uh, on the bottom right panel, you have the overall cost structure uh, or the overall costs, including um, expenses for staff, administrative expenses, uh, expenses for banknote and coin production, and, and some other items that are um, um, uh, given in the annual reports and in the annual financial statements of the central banks. And um, the overall costs amounted in 2016 to uh, about 10 billion, which is roughly 0.09% um, of GDP of the Eurozone. So you see we are in the same ballpark um, as the cost for the gold standard. Um, if we look at the Bank of England, they are a bit more cost efficient, although the trend is um, also uh, yeah, increasing. Um, in uh, 2016 and 2017, um, the overall expenses of the Bank of England um, were 412 million pounds and 647 million pounds, respectively, which corresponds to 0.02 percent of of the GDP of uh, the United, United Kingdom. Um, here we have um, the cost of the Bank of Japan, which is uh, the most expensive of all the uh, central banks or central bank systems relative to GDP. Um, in uh, 2017, um, the Bank of Japan uh, had expenses of about 610 billion yen, um, and this corresponds to 0.11% uh, of GDP. And then there is an outlier in 2003, um, where the expenses were even above our uh, upper bound benchmark that we have calculated earlier at 0.3% uh, of, of GDP. Um, and finally, uh, the Federal Reserve System, which is again compared to the Euro system and uh, the Bank of Japan more cost efficient. Um, here, uh, the overall expenses per year corresponded to roughly 0.02%. Uh, um, so what we can see is, that all of these estimated uh, or all of these uh, reported costs relative to GDP are in the same ballpark as our estimated costs for a gold standard with varying um, uh, degrees of, of uh, or varying reserve ratios. Our, remember, our lower bound um, uh, estimate is a 2% reserve uh, standard. The upper bound corresponds to 100% reserves on M1. This is, of course, more expensive than and most of the observed actual expenses of the central banks. Um, but um, the costs are well within those two uh, uh, bounds. OK, so what do we learn from this little uh, exercise? Um, First of all, we've seen, OK, the Fed and the Bank of England, for some reason, are more cost efficient than, uh, than relative to GDP than the euro system uh, and the Bank of Japan. Um, but uh, in every case, we see that the um, expected uh, cost savings from a fiat standard and having a modern uh, central banking system 
uh, are not as high as expected. So the argument is illusory, the classical argument for fiat money is illusory, um, at least when we look at these historical cases. Um, and a return to a commodity money, whatever um, reserve ratio uh, we would want to have, we can discuss this, but in general, the return to a commodity money uh, solely from the vantage point of the uh, cost of production uh, seems feasible. Um, thank you very much for your attention. So we have time for one quick question or a few quick questions answered all at once. Mr. Israel, your lecture was highly interesting, but uh, aren't, isn't the most important thing costs which are not, or advantages which are not quantifiable? Because yeah. when you have a solid currency backed by gold, then you have the confidence of people in the currency. And this confidence, which is, as, 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 as all people say, that the most important factor of a currency is confidence. And this confidence you cannot really quantify. And secondly, when you have a stable currency, as we had between 1871 and 1914, and between 1945 and 1971, then we had a flourishing uh, economy compared to the fiat situation in which we are afterwards, uh, we are afterwards in, a, in a more or less stagnant situation. So these are advantages which are really huge in comparison with the minimal costs. Yeah, I agree. Um Totally. Um, there are, of course, many other potential uh, benefits and, and, and costs that are not taken into account here. You know, this is really a simple accounting exercise. Uh, for example, uh, um, one of the costs uh, I consider also very important is, um, is the cost of, of human capital. I mean, if you look uh, at what the central banks, uh, what the uh, most important items of expenditure are, it's stuff costs. The people working at the central banks are, uh, on average, uh, highly educated. Um, uh, so there's human capital uh, bound in the in the central banks that if we hadn't the system, they would go into the economy and do uh, something else, maybe more productive. I mean, we can argue that about that. Um, in the in the classical gold standard, the cost structure would be very different. You would have expenses for uh, capital goods, machinery, uh, and and so on, and mining and and, and other things. Um, but yeah, there's no doubt there are other aspects that could be analyzed and should be analyzed and are analyzed. But uh, in this this paper, I take a much narrower view. Just look at the classical cost-saving uh, argument and, well, let's see if it holds uh, with respect to those modern uh, central banking systems. And, and I, I think I have shown in the paper that, well, uh, the cost-saving argument in these historical cases is not as strong and, and persuasive as it, as, it, as it looks. Of course, there's a grain of, a grain of truth in the argument, right? It could be much cheaper to have a fiat money, but in fact, it isn't. Okay, we can take one more question and we have to move the rest to the coffee break. Uh, hello. So if a gold standard exists in a single country, like uh, let's say the British pound right now, uh, a, can it survive? Uh, and uh, if so, uh, does the calculation change uh, to the cost uh, cost benefit uh, uh, costs analysis of uh, the lecture you just had? Thank you. Well, if we had a genuine gold standard somewhere, we wouldn't have to estimate the cost. We could look at, at the, if the numbers are, are published, we could look at what it costs. And this is another idea I had. We, maybe it's possible to find um, documents that report uh, the costs of historical cases where we had the gold standard and then calculate that relative to GDP. Um, so uh, your first question, could it um, 
um, uh, could it survive the gold standard if it were implemented somewhere? And I think, yeah, I mean, it depends on the political will to do it. Um, but in principle, I think it could, yeah. Thank you, Carl. Thank you.